Great. Well, welcome back to CE 397, Control Theory for Smart Infrastructure. Uh, it's great to see you all back. How is your uh, first week of classes going? It's going all right? Good. Let's go ahead and get started. So today I'm going to take things uh, a bit slow. What I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of get down some definitions and classifications that are going to be important for the rest of the class. Uh, in particular, I want to talk about systems, what I mean by systems in this class, uh, and what different types of systems exist, you know, for the purposes of this class. Um, and we're going to go through various types of classifications of systems. I've, I've mentioned the terms linear system, dynamical system, and you may be wondering uh, what those terms mean. Today, I'm going to try to um, just give an overview of what all the different classifications of systems are and which types of systems we'll be dealing with in this class. Okay, so in today's lecture, we're going to be uh, visiting a couple of different classifications of systems or dualities. Um, so I'll list the types of systems that we'll be covering today. So in today, we're going to classify systems into static versus dynamic systems. We're going to look at single versus multivariable systems. We're going to be looking at linear versus nonlinear systems. So this is an extremely important classification for the purposes of this class, linear versus nonlinear systems. We're going to be looking at the difference between deterministic and stochastic systems. And we're going to be looking at continuous versus discrete time systems. Okay. So uh, do these, uh, how many of these terms uh, look familiar to you? Are there any terms here that look familiar based on uh, materials I've seen in the past? Okay. So we're gonna be covering each of these different types of classifications. We're going to be giving definitions for them. Um, which will be helpful for the remainder of the class. Okay, so first, let's just start out very broadly. What are systems? So let's let's give the definition of a system for the purposes of this class. Okay. A system as we will be discussing it in this class, is simply a mathematical model that maps inputs to outputs. Okay, so very broad. This is a very broad definition, but it's one that uh, is going to be useful for us. Okay, so it is essentially a function. Let's draw a block diagram. Uh, we'll be using these throughout the course. As a function that maps some input and input here will usually be denoted uh, with the term ut. Welcome. So it's a mathematical model that maps some input to an output. So again, very broad. And our output will usually be denoted yt. And that's the convention that's usually used within uh, the field of controls or uh, dynamical systems. Okay, so the input This is denoted UT, and it may also be called an excitation or forcing. Um, 
in some other fields like computational fluid dynamics, it might also be called a source term. You might hear, uh, hear that terminology, but it's essentially something that uh, it's an exogenous input that comes from outside the system usually that causes the system to move or react in some way. Okay, so it, it may be something that you as the operator control, or it may be a disturbance that you have no control over, but uh, it is something that causes the system to react in some way and produce an output. Okay, so an output is often called the response or sometimes uh, the observable observable output of the system. And this is some output of the system that we can observe or measure. Um, so for example, you may have a structural system, um, you know, consisting of a, a, a building or structure or a beam. Uh, you may have an input to the system consisting of, for instance, a force. So uh, you may strike the, the structural system with a hammer. Um, the structural system may be exposed to some sort of earthquake or something like that. And the observable output of the system might be the displacement of the structure, or the vibration of the structure. Okay. So that's uh, one example of a system in the civil engineering domain. I should note uh, that in addition to an input and an output, there's also what's called a state. Okay. So sometimes uh, the system will have an internal state that we may not be able to observe directly. Um, so in the case of uh, a structure, you may have your input being your forcing, your excitation, your vibration, uh, sorry, your, your force uh, causing the system to move. Your output may be that you can only measure, for instance, the acceleration of the structure, but your states may also include uh, you know, the displacement of the structure, its velocity, uh, and so on. Okay, so sometimes in addition to an input and output, you'll also have an internal state of the system that may or may not be directly observable. So let's uh, take things a little bit slow at first. What are some examples of systems in the civil engineering domain? So what are, what are some examples of uh, civil infrastructure systems that can be described using this framework? So I gave one example of a structural system. What are some other examples you can think of, of systems that have an input and an output and possibly some internal states? Right, so uh, we could have a river uh, or you know, generally maybe a fluid system. Okay, and um, maybe to simplify it, let's maybe think of um, something like a reservoir or a pond. This may make it um, you know, simpler to think about um, what the input and output might be, right? So let's say we have a reservoir, may have some water level, okay? Uh, and what would the input and output of this system be? What's, what's one example of an input and an output? Yes, yeah, so you might have some inflow. So we could describe that by UT. So we may have inflow coming in from an upstream channel, or we may have rainfall falling on the reservoir. Um, what's, an, what's an example of what an output might be? Yeah, so the, the outflow of water from the reservoir. And in addition to those two, what might an internal state be of the system? Right, the volume or the depth of water in the pond. Uh, so this might be our state X of T. Okay. So that's an example of another type of system that we may deal with in civil infrastructure. Did you have a question? Well, would, could you not also define the height as the output? Is that what you're talking about? Right, so it's very flexible. You can you can define the input, output, and state in whatever way suits the analysis you're doing. Um, this is just one kind of natural uh, uh, partitioning of input, output, and state. Um, the first that came to mind here. What are some other examples, um, you know, possibly related to your work or your field of study? 
Okay. So yeah, like a HVAC uh, air handler. Okay. You may have, uh, I'll just write also HVAC system. Okay. So what would, what would an example of a input and an output be for, for that type of system? So the valve position might be the input, right? So your input might be the valve position. And what might your output be? Air temperature. Air temperature, very good. All right. So this framework is very broad, but we can use it to kind of conceptualize uh, different types of civil infrastructure systems, whether it's a hydraulic system, a structural system, an electrical system, an HVAC system, and you'll get lots of uh, practice formulating those systems uh, mathematically as we move on further in the course, but I want to make it clear what I'm talking about when I'm talking about uh, systems. Okay, so again, it's very broad and it'll become more clear later on, but I want to uh, kind of inculcate this idea of a system with some input that you may be able to control or that may be some disturbance uh, along with an output of the system that we can observe and an internal state of the system, which we may not be able to fully observe. Okay, you have a question? Yeah, so one more. So like the state and the output are both exclusively observable and the inputs must be documented. So when we move on to um, dynamical systems, which will be most of the course, yes, we will typically think of an input as being exogenous, uh, something that comes from outside of the system. Um, and the output is generally what's going to be observed. The internal states may not necessarily be observed. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So great questions. Uh, any other questions just on this? conceptual framework of what a system is. Oh. Okay, cool. So let's move on and let's discuss different types of systems. Uh, I'm gonna discuss those classifications that we talked about earlier. So first let's talk about static versus dynamic systems. So let's take a look at static systems first. By the way, who's heard, who's heard these uh, terms before in your classes? Static versus dynamic systems. Anyone heard these these terms? Okay, cool. So a static system is one in which the output depends only on the current input. So the output at time t depends only on the input at time t. Okay, so let's give some examples. First, let's take a look at a simple spring system. So this is a spring attached to some support. Uh, let's just assume that it has no mass for right now. Okay, so we have a spring and let's draw a little loopy loop like that. Okay, so we have a spring uh, and let's just say that this is its um, resting position. And if we apply a force to the spring, that spring will displace some amount. Okay, so taking, taking us all the way back to physics 100 here. Okay, applying a force will cause the spring to displace by some amount, which I will call X of T. All right. So let me just draw the force there to make it clear that this force is also being applied here. Uh, actually, you know what? Let me remove this here to, so this we can consider the, the spring in its resting state when no force is being applied. When a force is applied, the spring will uh, have some displacement, right? 
and the force can either be applied left or right. So who remembers uh, what equation describes the relationship between, uh, in kind of the classical mechanics sense, uh, the force applied to a spring and its displacement? Right, so it's uh, described by what's called Hooke's law. So this was formulated all the way back in like the 17th century. Um, and it's an approximation of the real world dynamics, but uh, we can describe the relationship between the force and the displacement as f of t is equal to k times x of t, where k, k is our spring constant. Okay, so note here, this is a static system because the force in the spring and the displacement uh, have a one-to-one -one relationship, right? The output depends only on the input at time t. So the output at time t only depends on the input at time t. Uh, so question, what is the input and what is the output of this system? What's the input and what's the output? Right, so you could you could think of f of t as being the input and x of t as being the output. So in that case, the force thing you're applying is you are applying a force to the spring as the input and it results in some displacement x of t, which is your output. But you could also think of the input as being the displacement and the f of t as being the force that is induced by that displacement. So, right, so you can take the spring uh, you can stretch it and that induces some force in the spring. So um, the input and output as you define them depend on what question you're interested in answering here. Okay, it could be that X of T is the output or X of T is the input. Okay, let's go through another example of a static system. Let's look at a resistive circuit. Okay, so we have a circuit here. There is a voltage source. This could be a battery. Okay, we have our wire coming out. Uh, we have a resistor. And we can close the loop. Okay, so our voltage, we can call V of T. Our resistor, has some resistance, which I'll call R. So this is just a parameter of the system. And then in addition to the voltage, we also have a current in the wire that is induced by our voltage source, which I will call I of T. Okay, so who remembers the how voltage and current are related within a resistive circuit? Uh, yeah, so V equals IR, right? And what's the name for that uh, equation? Ohm's law, yeah, right. Ohm's law states that the uh, voltage and the current in a resistive circuit are uh, linearly related to each other or directly proportional. So V is equal to the resistance times the current I of T. Okay, so note that uh, in this case, you know, as with the spring system, the voltage at time t only depends on the current at time t and vice versa, right? The, the state of the system at some previous point in time doesn't affect this relationship, right? There's a one-to-one -one relationship between the voltage and the current in this circuit, okay? So that is characteristic of a static system. The other type of system, and the one that we'll be dealing with primarily in this class, uh, is a dynamic system. Okay, and in a dynamic system, the output depends on both current and past inputs and states of the system. 
uh, or in other words, the system has some memory of its past inputs and states. Okay. And these systems are usually described by either differential equations in continuous time or difference equations in discrete time. So you've seen dynamical systems uh, probably in, in your differential equations class in undergrad. Uh, it's a system in which your output depends not only on the input at the current time, but also on past inputs uh, and past states of the system. So let's go through an example of a dynamic or dynamical system. Uh, and we're going to extend that example we showed of a spring system earlier. We're going to look at a structural system. So who here is a structural engineer? Right, uh, Colin, right? Um, so let's, let's create a simplified model of a structural system. Okay, let's say we have uh, some beam. Yeah, this might be like an idealized representation of a, a story in a building. Okay, and the beam is fixed to these two vertical beams that go into the ground. Okay, so we have uh, some, you know, possibly a floor in a building supported by two beams. Uh, we have an input to the system, f of t. So this is a force that's being applied to this structure. Uh, this could be, for instance, an earthquake. It could be something like a, a, a crane hitting the structure. It's just some excitation that is causing the structural system to move. Okay, So the forcing is applied to the structural system, and that produces some displacement x of t. Okay. And there's a couple other things we have to note about the structural system here. We'll assume that this structure has some mass, m, and that these beams that are supporting the structure, these have some stiffness, k. OK, so when, when the force, uh, when the outside force is applied to the structure, the beams will deflect, and they will kind of have a, a springiness to them and they will resist the force that's being applied to them, uh, much like a spring, much like the spring we showed in the previous example. Okay, so we have that our input is the force applied to the structure, our output is the displacement of the structure, and there's some physical parameters describing our structural system. How can we formulate a model for simulating the movement of the structure given some force applied to it? How might we do that? You think back to uh, maybe your um, differential equations class or your physics, uh, early physics classes. How would we model the movement of this structure mathematically? Exactly. So we can model the system using Newton's second law, which states that the sum of forces acting on the structure is equal to its mass times its acceleration, right? So the unbalanced force is equal to ma, okay? So let's think about what are the forces acting in the structure? Let's, let's break down this sum of F term here. What are, the, what are the forces acting on this structure? Uh, the weight of the beam. So let's consider just in the horizontal direction. So we're only interested in the uh, the x in the horizontal. Exactly. So there's two forces uh, for this simplified model. There is, I'll just write it down here. We have the force acting in the right direction, f of t minus the spring force that's resisting it, which is k times x of t from Hooke's law. Okay, so we're treating this like a spring mass system, if you may uh, remember a spring mass system from your uh, differential equations class. Okay, and that is equal to mass times acceleration. 
Okay, how can we uh, maybe simplify this a little bit? Uh, let's say we want to put everything in terms of just the force being applied and the displacement. How might we do that? Oh, let me let me write this out. Acceleration is a function of time. Right. So we can replace this acceleration term with the second derivative of the displacement because the acceleration is equal to the second derivative of, of displacement here. Okay, then we can rewrite this system. Uh, let me just rewrite it in a different form. Let's put all the uh, outputs on one side and the input on the other side. And we can write this as m times x double dot t. You may remember that notation from differential equations. That just means the uh, second derivative of the displacement with respect to time. Uh, plus k times x of t is equal to f of t. Okay, so this is a dynamical system. Um, now, if you knew, for instance, what the force was being applied to the structure at some time t, would you necessarily know what the displacement of the structure is? No. And why is that? Right. So it depends not only on the current force being applied to the structure, but also, you know, for instance, what the structure's initial conditions were, uh, what forces were applied at previous time steps, and so on. So, for instance, um, let's say you hit the structure with a hammer, and the structure will kind of uh, move with the force that's applied to it. And then the springiness will cause the structure to move back. And then it will kind of keep oscillating until it eventually, uh, well, in this case, there's no damping. So it will continue to oscillate forever, um, right? Um, but knowing the force applied at some time t doesn't necessarily tell you what the displacement of the structure is gonna be. It's dynamic. It has some memory to it, okay? Are there any questions on static versus dynamic Systems. Mm -hmm. uh, so for that one, I was just looking at a massless spring, and I was just looking at. Um, I just wanted to look at that spring relationship to get, uh, you know, to get this for a more physical example. So in that case, I was only interested in just the spring force itself. Uh, but that's a good question. So in reality, any any spring would actually have a mass as well. And if you model it using Newton's second law, it would give you uh, a relationship like this. Uh, a real spring will also have some damping, which will eventually cause the motion to stop, which we'll talk about uh, in the next couple of lectures. Uh, yeah, but good question. Yes, yeah, so for continuous time systems, it will be described by a differential equation. And for discrete time systems, it will be described by a difference equation. Okay, which we'll, uh, we'll talk a bit more about those in the coming weeks. Yeah. But this is the type of system we're going to be primarily dealing with in this class. It turns out that most physical systems can be described by a dynamical model like this one, if you derive its uh, dynamics from first principles. Okay. okay, great, great questions. Okay, so let's let's move on to our second duality or classification. Um, this one I'm not gonna spend too much time on, but let's look at single versus multivariable systems. Okay, so a single variable system. This is what we're going to be looking at uh, for essentially the first third or half of the class. Okay, and this is modeled by a scalar equation. Okay, so we may have our block diagram here. Let me give myself a little more room. Uh, we have our block diagram 
we have some input ut, which is a scalar, um, and some output yt, which is also a scalar. Okay, and our equation that describes the relationship between these two is something like yt, our output, is equal to uh, f of ut, hokum. Uh, or just in uh, simpler terms, I, we can also just in shorthand write y equals f of u. Okay, so it's modeled by a scalar equation. Um, a multivariable system This is modeled by a set of equations. All right. So I guess we might have to get to linear algebra for, before I can get to a formal definition of a scalar. But you can think of a scalar right now as just being like, uh, for instance, a real number. Um, an integer, so a, a, essentially a, a scalar as opposed to a vector. Okay. So like a, a real number, um, primarily we're going to be talking about real numbers. In fact, I don't know if uh, integer can be considered a scalar now that I think about it, but we'll get to that when we get to the linear algebra portion of the course. But for now, just think of it as a, as a real number. Yeah. Uh, multivariable systems are modeled by sets of equations. So in this case, we have some system. We may have multiple inputs. So we may have U1, U2, U3, and we may have multiple outputs. So we may have uh, Y1 and Y2. Okay. And instead of having a single scalar equation, we may have a set of equations uh, that model the output of this system from the input. So we have Y1 is equal to F1 of U1, U2, U3. We might also have Y2 is equal to F2 of U1, U2, U3. Okay, so uh, it's a system in which we have, you know, possibly multiple outputs and multiple equations that describe the mapping from inputs to outputs. And note that if the system is linear, how might we represent this uh, input-output relationship? Uh, yeah, as a matrix equation, right? So if it's linear, if we get lucky, we can write y is equal to a times u, where a is a matrix and u and y are vectors. Great. Are there any questions on single versus multivariable systems? We'll get uh, this distinction more when we get to the, the second half of the course, where we'll be dealing with multivariable systems. For the first half of the course, we're primarily going to be dealing with single variable systems. All right. All right. Next, we come to possibly our most important classification for the purposes of this class, the most important classification for uh, for you to understand, and that is linear versus nonlinear systems. Who has some familiarity with linear versus nonlinear systems? Uh, a little bit. Okay, let's go. Let's give the definition, the formal definition of what a linear system is. Okay. A system is linear, I'll just write this out in full, a system is linear if it satisfies superposition. Who's heard of the term superposition? Okay. So let me give you the formal definition. Uh, let me actually, I'll write out the block diagram. So we have a system which we'll call F. So it's a function that maps an input 
ut to some output uh, yt. Okay. And in order to satisfy supervision, uh, superposition, our function f has to satisfy the following properties. Okay, the first is additivity. Okay. Is there a question? No? Okay. Additivity. So if we have two inputs to the system, u1 and u2, and we run them both through the system, the output uh, will be the same as applying that system to them separately. So, uh, and adding them together. Okay, so if you have, if we apply our system to u1 plus u2, it will be equal to f of u1 plus f of u2. Okay, that's the first property. The second property is homogeneity. Okay, in other words, uh, if we have an input to the system u and we scale it by some constant alpha, so I'm gonna say alpha u. So if we take our function f and apply it to alpha u, our result is simply equal to alpha times f of u. Okay. And often you'll see these two properties combined together. So let me just write together. A system is linear if the following holds that the system applied to alpha u1 plus beta u2 is equal to alpha f of u1 plus beta f of u2. Okay. So any system that satisfies these two properties is linear. A nonlinear system, I'll let you finish writing, but I'll just I'll just say it. A nonlinear system is any system that does not satisfy superposition. So it's a negatively defined category. Anything that doesn't meet these requirements is nonlinear. So I will write that out. Uh, any system that does not satisfy superposition. So there's a negatively defined category. Um, this is an extremely important distinction for this class um, because most of the systems we're going to be looking at in this class are going to be linear. And that is because linear systems are usually the only dynamical systems that you can actually solve. Um, so we'll talk more about it a little bit later on in the course when we get to solutions of linear differential equations. Um, but I just want to make sure that this distinction is clear to you. There will be some examples of showing linearity versus nonlinearity on the homework. Uh, when you do that, all you need to do is apply the definition of superposition. If it meets that definition, it's linear. If it doesn't meet that definition, it is nonlinear. Okay, so on the homework, when it asks you if it's linear or nonlinear, just apply superposition and see what comes out. Did you have a question, Jimmy? Yeah. Is superposition the same as saying that F is a linear operator? Yes, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, very good. Okay, so let's give a couple uh, examples. I'm gonna give an example of a linear system and a nonlinear system and how we can check. Um, so first, let's take a look. Let's take a look at our spring. I'm just going to call it our linear spring. Okay, so much like before, we have some spring attached to a wall. Okay. Um, and let's say we have two different force inputs. Uh, actually, let's say we have two different displacements we apply to this spring. Um, we have one displacement we apply, which I'll call X1. Okay, and maybe we have another displacement that we can apply to the spring, 
which I'll call uh, X2. So maybe they're slightly different. Here's X1, here's X2. Okay, and note that when we apply displacement X1, it produces a uh, force in the spring, F1. And if we apply a uh, displacement X2, it produces a reactive force F2, okay? So what if we take the spring and we apply both displacements to it? What if we add those two displacements together? Okay, so we're taking, okay, spring compresses a little more. We're adding both X1 and X2 together. Uh, so let's say we have X2 here and we're adding X1. That's going to produce a force, which I'll just call uh, F. Okay. And what we need to do now is we need to verify that this force here that's produced from adding those two inputs together is the same uh, as applying them separately, essentially, right? So let's go ahead and do that. We know that from our spring equation, f of t is equal to k times x of t. We have that the, uh, the induced force corresponding to x1 is f1. And we have that the induced force corresponding to x2 is equal to kx2. Okay, so what happens now if we take f of alpha x1 plus beta x2? So what will we get over on the right-hand side? Okay, so this is this here is a is a displacement, right? Alpha x1 plus beta x2. So we go and take this and we just plug it into x xt here, right? So what we'll get is k times alpha x1 plus beta x2. Okay, and we can rearrange this. Um, this will become uh, alpha k x1 plus beta k x2, right? Okay, and what is this term here? This is F1, and what is this term here? F2. And so we have that our system applied to alpha x1 plus beta x2 is equal to alpha f1 plus beta f2. So is this system linear or nonlinear? As linear, right? I, I have it up there on the top of the slide, but this is a linear system because it satisfies superposition. Okay, let's take a look at a, another example. Let's look at a nonlinear spring. Okay, so much like before, we have our spring. Okay, uh, you know, you have a force, FT, a displacement. Uh, sorry, that doesn't make any sense. XT. Um, so let's say we have a spring, but its equation of displacement uh, is force displacement relationship is nonlinear. Okay, so we have that f of t is equal to k times x squared of t. Okay, so let's see what happens when we try to apply superposition to this one. Okay, so we have uh, some input displacement x1 that will result in uh, the relationship f1 is equal to k times x1 squared. And we have some input x2 that will result in the relationship f2 is equal to k x2 squared. Okay, so let's apply this system to uh, alpha x1 plus beta x2. And let's see if this is equal to alpha. F1 plus beta F2. 
Okay, so what will what will this term here be equal to? So we're considering alpha x1 plus beta x2 as our net displacement. So what will the left-hand side be here? Let me start by putting a k, All right? And what will what will uh, what will be our this term here? Right. So let's uh, yeah, let's break it down into two steps here. Uh, but that's the right answer. Yep. So we'll get alpha x one plus beta x two all squared. Okay. And we need to find if this is equal to alpha f one plus beta f two. Uh, we can expand this out, and we get uh, you know alpha squared x one squared plus uh, two alpha beta x one x two plus beta squared uh, x two squared. Okay, and you can see that this is not not going to be the same thing as alpha f one plus beta f two. So this is nonlinear. Okay, when you go on the homework to test whether a system is linear or nonlinear, this is ex the exact test I want you to apply because this is the definition of a linear versus a nonlinear system. Okay, so let me pose a question to you. Is there such a thing as a linear system in the real world? Is there a civil infrastructure system you could think of that is a linear system? What about the spring system? What, what about a spring? Is a spring in the real world linear or not? No, I'm seeing some no's. Why, why is a spring in the real world not truly linear? Right. So that is that is a, a correct answer. Um, so let's think about what happens when you have a spring. Like so this is this is kind of the general reason why any system in the real world uh, will not be linear. Let's take a spring and let's stretch it out and let's keep stretching it out until it goes to the moon, for instance, right? Uh, what's going to happen when the spring gets stretched to the moon? What is the force going to scale linearly with the displacement of the spring? No. What's going to happen to the spring? <laughs> It'll break, right? It'll break, uh, or it will deform so much that um, you know it'll no longer have that linear relationship between uh, the force and the displacement. It'll re deform relatively quickly, much you know, much sooner than you get to the moon. Um, or if you take our circuit system from earlier, right? Uh, so we have a linear relationship between the voltage and the current. Will that relationship hold for every current that you apply to the system? No. What if you what if you take your little benchtop Arduino circuit and you try to run ten thousand amps through it? Yeah, <laughs> the, the system will vaporize, right? So for any real world system, there will eventually be some saturation point at which the linear dynamics no longer apply. I personally cannot think of any physical system in the real world that retains linearity through its entire uh, range. Um, if you can think of an example, let me know, but I cannot think of any. Most, most real world systems will be uh, nonlinear um but that said it's important to understand linear dynamics because it gives us insight uh, that will be important for understanding the behavior of nonlinear systems later okay great all right uh let's keep going here um so the next distinction i want to talk about is time invariant versus time varying systems. 
Okay. Uh, and this one is not too difficult to think about. A time invariant system is one in which the model parameters do not change over time. Okay, so the model parameters stay constant over time. Okay, so let's give an example. Uh, we can go back to the resistive circuit, the idealized resistive circuit that we showed earlier. Okay, we have our voltage source, we have our resistor. Okay, uh, and some resistance R, some voltage V of T, some current I of T. And from Ohm's law, we have that the voltage is equal to the resistance times the current. Okay, so our, our resistance is a constant parameter. It doesn't change in time. Okay, so a, a system is time invariant if none of it, the model parameters change over time. Okay, so let's take our idealized linear circuit and let's put it in the real world. What we get is a time varying system. And this is one in which the model parameters do change over time. Okay, so let's say we have our circuit, voltage source, resistor, Yeah, some voltage V of T. Uh, we have a current I of T. But let's say we take our circuit and we put it outside. And every morning the sun comes up and it shines on our circuit. Okay. And when the sun comes out and it shines on our circuit, it changes the resistance of the resistor. Okay, so now our resistance is a function of time. And let's just say that the resistance as a function of time uh, is equal to alpha times sine of phi times t. Okay, so our equation for the relationship between the voltage and the current is now V of t is equal to alpha times sine phi t times uh, the current i t. So note that when I when I talk about time varying systems here, I mean that the parameters vary with time in an absolute sense. Okay, so they are dependent on time itself and not on the input, right? So what would happen if we had that our resistance here was changed by the current going through the circuit? What if we had that, uh, what if we had, what if, R of T was equal to the square root of the current, for example. What type of system would that be? Right. This would be this would just be nonlinear. Right. So when I talk about time varying, I mean that the model parameters vary with time in an absolute sense and not through the input. Okay. Because this would just be nonlinear. The distinction is there because time varying systems can, you can often find closed form solutions for them, whereas nonlinear systems, you generally won't be able to. So uh, time varying is kind of a separate category where the model parameters vary with the time, uh, but it's not nonlinear. Right. So, so yes, you could draw the boundary of the system and model the movement of the sun as well and how it affects the system. But yes, it does. Yeah, it does depend on where you draw the boundary. Yeah, it's a good point. Okay. Yeah. So, um, what I, what the distinction I wanted to make is that 
generally nonlinear systems you should categorize as being separate. So time varying, you can have linear time varying systems. Um, but generally, when we're talking about time varying, we mean that the parameters of the system depend on time in some way, in an absolute sense. Uh, right. So for that case, what I would uh, recommend doing is go to superposition and check if um, the input output relationship between V and I is linear in this case, and it will be because. Right, it's it's linear with respect to your input. Yeah. Great, great questions. Okay, so I just want to give you a quick method for determining whether a system is time varying or not. So, how to tell? Okay. Um, essentially, if you shift the input by some time increment tau um, the, and the output also shifts by tau, that means your system is time invariant, right? If, if you can get y at t minus tau just by shifting u to tau, uh, let, me, uh, let me write this out because it's a bit difficult to say it in words. Um, so shift the input signal. by tau. So you get ut becomes ut minus tau. So does the output yt also become yt minus tau? Okay, so let's give an example of a time invariant system. Okay, so we'll have uh, some system yt is equal to cosine of ut. Okay, so let's take our ut and shift it by tau. So we have cosine of ut minus tau. Okay, and note that that's the same thing as yt minus tau. Right? If you take your cosine function, you shift it by some time, we can just call this quantity here t prime, right? So this will be the same as just our function yt at time t prime. Yes, we've just shifted the input and that shifts the output by the same amount. Okay, let's give an example of a time varying system. Okay, so we have yt is equal to t times cosine of ut. Okay, and if we shift our input by tau, we will get t times cosine of u t minus tau. And note that this is not the same thing as y t minus tau, because y t minus tau is equal to t minus tau times cosine u t minus tau. I can't put that on one line here. Okay. So when it comes to the homework and you're trying to determine whether a system is time invariant or time varying, this is the test you will want to apply. Okay. Are there any, any questions on this test. I know it, uh, it's a bit difficult to describe in words, right? But essentially what you want to check for is if the system is time, vary, uh, time invariant, if you shift the input by some time increment, you will get the output shifted by that time increment as well. And that's just a consequence of the model parameters not varying with time. Okay, are there any questions? Mm -hmm. Right. So, so the idea for this test is to see if the system is time invariant and you shift the input by some time increment t, you will get the output at 
you know, t shifted by that increment, right? If the model parameters also vary with time, though, and you shift the input by some increment t, you won't necessarily get the same answer as, you know, the output shifted by that amount of t. Um, so, for instance, in this case, uh, for our time invariant system, our function is cosine of our input. And if we shift the input, um, you know, perhaps, perhaps I can draw a picture here. Um, uh, we can just say that, uh, right, if we shift our input to the system by some amount t, it will also shift the output by some amount t, right? Uh, it's the same as just de defining a new time variable t prime as being t minus tau and just evaluating our function at that new time. Whereas with a, when you have a time varying parameter like this function where you have a, a t, which is not a part of the input, if you shift the input by some amount t minus tau, um, it will not be the same as the output at time t minus tau. Okay. So uh, let me know if you still have questions about this and I can um, maybe maybe visit it at office hours uh, and also try on the homework just to see if uh, see if it becomes more clear. Um, but yeah, happy to happy to help later on. If you have more questions. No, you can have linear time varying systems as well. Um, because in this case, uh, well, this one has a cosine in it. But um, if you go back to this case here, if you apply superposition here, you will see that the voltage is still a linear function of your current input. It's just that this parameter will be time varying. Okay. So I would, uh, if you're curious, try applying superposition. Uh, and verify that the system remains linear even when it has a time varying parameter. Okay, so I'm probably not going to get to all of my classifications here uh, in the time we have left. I'm gonna I'm gonna just go for the two most important ones, I think. Um, first of those is deterministic versus stochastic systems. In this class, we'll be mostly looking at deterministic systems, although we will be taking a look at stochastic systems towards the very end of the course when we talk about uh, estimation techniques like Kalman filtering, for instance. Uh, so it's an important uh, definition to have in mind. So a deterministic system is one in which the model parameters and input are known precisely. So the model parameters and input are known. Uh, as an example, let's take a look at a sinusoidal volt voltage source. Okay, so we can say that our voltage T, we just have some circuit and we apply an, uh, some AC circuit where our voltage uh, varies sinusoidally in time. Uh, our voltage T is equal to alpha times sine phi of T, okay? And if we draw that out, what we'll get is something that looks like this. This is a AC circuit with a voltage that's just cycling uh, as a sinusoid over time. Um, so this is VT, this x-axis here is T. And our voltage will fluctuate like so. Okay. All right. So a stochastic system is one in which the model parameters and input uh, are not known exactly 
and are characterized by statistical distribution. So I'll just write model parameters and inputs are characterized by statistical distributions. Okay. So as an example, let's take our sinusoidal voltage source. And instead of looking at the actual voltage that's in the circuit, we have a noisy measurement of our sinusoidal, sinusoidal voltage. Okay, so I'll write noisy measurement of uh, voltage. Okay, so now we have uh, our voltage V of T. Um, actually, let me write this as Y of T. This is our observed voltage is equal to alpha times sine phi of t plus xt, uh, where xt is a source of random noise, right? It's not something we can know exactly. And I'm running out of space on this slide, but I will just write this. X is a normally distributed random variable with mean of zero and a standard deviation of uh, uh, sigma. Actually, I'll write in terms of the variance, sigma squared. Okay, so we have our initial voltage source, but we're adding some random noise to it that's just characteristic of our, our, our measurement device, for instance. So when you go in the real world and you try to measure a voltage, uh, you'll often see that it's uh, noisy, right? Uh, and that just has to do with the measurement error. So, instead of having a nice sinusoidal voltage curve like this one, we will have something that looks like this. Okay. So this is an example of a stochastic system uh, measuring the voltage at some point in time. We don't know exactly what it's going to be. There's some uncertainty. Uh, characterized with our voltage source at each time step. Okay, so uh, this is pretty common when we get to the, the estimation part of the course where we may not have perfect observations of our systems. Okay, great. And we got about five minutes left. I'm gonna cover the, um, the final uh, distinction that I think is important to recognize. Oh, yes. I know this Yes. Yeah. So that's an, that's another great way of characterizing it. So if it's, if your system is deterministic, um, and you know you have some input, uh, let's just call it the sine of phi of t term. The output at that time step will always be the same. For the stochastic one, there will be some randomness associated with the result. Okay. So yeah, very good. Okay. So the final distinction I want to make is continuous versus discrete time systems. Okay, so a continuous system, uh, this is one in which the inputs and outputs uh, are continuous functions of time. Okay. And time uh, varies continuously over the set of real numbers. Uh, which I'll just write as R here. This is the symbol for the set of real numbers. Uh, so as an example of a continuous time system, we can look at our structural system. Where our dynamics are described by mass times the second derivative of the displacement 
with respect to time plus k times the displacement is equal to f of t. Okay, so in this sense, uh, both the input and output are continuous functions of time. Uh, quick conceptual question here. Um, considering the displacement as the input and the force as the output, is this system linear or nonlinear? So, sorry? Linear, right. So you will prove this on the homework. Um, but systems of this form, uh, where you have only derivatives uh, or integrals of your uh, inputs and outputs uh, with constant parameters, this will be uh, 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 linear. Okay, so you'll show this on the homework one. Okay, is this time varying or time invariant? Do the model parameters change in time or no? No. So this is time invariant. This is a linear time invariant dynamical system uh, and also continuous in time. Okay, let's go for a discrete time system. Okay, uh, the inputs and outputs are defined over a discrete time scale. Okay, so there are discrete time increments. Okay. Um, and some processes are inherently discrete. Other times you can arrive at a discrete time system by either sampling or discretizing a continuous time system. So this is often used for um, numerical solvers. Uh, if you're doing CFD work, for instance, um, often you will end up discretizing the full continuous dynamics of a system to simulate it. Uh, but there are also processes that are inherently discrete. So one example I can give is interest on a bank account. Okay, so let's say we have uh, given an interest rate I compounded annually uh, the balance Y in year k plus one is given by the following difference equation, y at year k plus one, so this is the balance at year k plus one, is equal to one plus i times the balance at year k. Okay, uh, And the general solution to this difference equation is given by y at year k plus n. So this is the balance at year k plus n is equal to one plus i to the nth power times uh, the balance at year k. Okay, so this is an example of an inherently discrete process. They're usually not found in the natural world, um, but interest on a bank account is one example of a discrete time process. Uh, quick quiz question, is this a static or dynamic system? Is this a static or a dynamic system? Exactly, so this is a dynamic system. It is a discrete time dynamic system, uh, which is described by a difference equation. Okay, so it's dynamic because the output at a time k uh, is dependent on the inputs and states at previous time steps, right? So very good, okay. Uh, 
those are all the definitions that I have time for today. I just want to quickly recap, so this will take about 30 seconds. Um, so I went through various definitions for you um, of the types of systems that exist and how they might be used to model real world systems. Uh, let's talk about the types of systems we'll be looking at in this class. So in this class, we're going to be looking at systems that are primarily deterministic, time invariant, linear, uh, and mostly continuous. We will look a, a little bit at uh, discrete time systems as well, but we'll be emphasizing continuous time systems, okay? So at first glance, this might seem a bit limiting, right? So we're basically looking at the, the most simple case of systems possible. Oh, and I should also note, uh, we're going to be primarily looking at dynamic as opposed to static systems. So it might seem a bit limiting, um, but studying systems of this kind is going to provide the foundation for looking at more complex um, nonlinear time varying systems later on. So it's important to get these, uh, these fundamentals in place before we uh, move on to more advanced dynamical nonlinear systems. So um, that's all I have for today. Uh, it was great uh, having you here with me and I look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, yeah, ciao. Oh, by the way, the EWRE seminar is today at 3.30, uh, if you're interested in attending that. Uh, so this is for the water resources uh, folks in particular, but all are welcome to join. So, great.